Mm. I see a lot of hands and a lot of people have requested already the floor. It's well noted, so we'll come to that. Nicholas, you had the great introduction from Yanni Thomato, so I will not go through all your CV. I'm just going to say that I very much believe in metadata analysis and the analysis of data that's been published over time. This is what Nicholas does leading a team of 1,500 analysts, and he does it every day. So he has the condensed metadata analysis for us. Nicholas, thanks for being here with us. And the topic of this year's Delphi is turning unprecedented risk into an unprecedented opportunity. And I'm guessing that, Nicholas, in a way, this is what we're trying to decipher here. The last few years, COVID aside, and even with COVID, uh, business had the pretty good run. And now we're looking at growing clouds and potentially a more recessionary environment. Is that the take you have at Oxford Analytica? Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yes. Um, I think it's very easy to get trapped in the new cycle and what exports are this month, what retail sales is this month, is the ECB going to go 25 basis points, 50 basis points, zero, and to miss the paradigm shift, or even to look at PMI to get a view of the future, to miss the paradigm shift, which is that for about the past 10 years, we've in, been in a period of unique experimentation for the major central banks around the world with ultra low interest rates and quantitative easing. Never has so much credit been created so cheaply at such scale and so quickly in world financial history. However, it did not succeed in the central bank's core objective of getting inflation reliably to 2%. And so at the back end of 2021, the Federal Reserve made a series of announcements that signaled that that period was over. It was done with the experiment, and it was going to start on a process of raising interest rates and shrinking a balance sheet that almost reached $9 trillion. The ECB followed not long after that, Bank of England also at that point. The Bank of Japan is the one wonderful exception uh, uh, to the list, but that's Japan. Um, I think it's interesting to think about what higher interest rates mean for the global economy when you consider this last sort of few years. Because if you smooth out the effects of post-pandemic recovery when we all saw good growth, it wasn't actually a stellar last 10 years for the global economy. Growth really wasn't that great. Now, the question I have that I'm afraid the metadata doesn't give me an answer to yet is, what does that do to GDP growth when money is more expensive? The optimist says that higher interest rates, more expensive money, forces greater discipline in decision making, and actually we get growth. You, don't know, what, you know what the pessimist says, I won't, I won't cover that bit. So before we get to that question of how the economy is going to go in the next two years, we've got a debt crisis in emerging markets to deal with as a result of these higher interest rates. For a year or more, even before the Fed started, a number of the banks in emerging markets were hiking interest rates. They were doing that because they saw that the dollar was going up and they didn't want to lose, uh, they didn't want to lose their exchange rate against the dollar. Why? Per Firstly, they were worried about import bills, but more importantly, they were worried about imported inflation. Inflation was already going up in their, in their currencies, and then if their currencies was weakening against the dollar, they were just getting more of an inflationary hit. So they moved fast. There is much more of this still to come. Remember that interest rate rises tend to take 18 to 24 months to fully filter through into the economy. So what are we looking at? Governments, particularly in the developing world, will struggle to refinance their debts at higher rates. Those that overextended themselves are going to face great difficulties. Emerging markets feeling the pitch already. We know that Sri Lanka's already gone, Zambia's gone, Pakistan is on the brink. Argentina is really looking very bad at this point. Is it actually going to make it to election for or not? Last month, Kenya, a country you wouldn't necessarily think about, didn't pay some of its public sector workers. It's a bit of an oddity why. They seem to have the money, but there is a big debt uh, repayment coming up uh, next year, and, and they seem to be quite concerned about that. Companies, too, and this is the unusual part. We've seen sovereign debt crises before, right? But in the last 10 years, 40% of the debt that was taken out in emerging markets was taken out not by governments, but by companies. 
Now, as their home markets enter recession, those companies are going to struggle to service those debts. And remember that, in this case, resolution is going to be very difficult. And like sovereigns, there's no EU, there's no IMF, there's no Paris club, there's no London club. There's just a lot of national courts. That's going to be a very messy process unless governments step in and take some of that debt on. I think it's also worth remembering that one of the outcomes of QE was the fact that we had the phenomenon of zombie companies, and that's as much a developed market, in fact, more of a developed market phenomenon than the other one. These are companies that really couldn't invest, couldn't innovate, could only pay their debts and just struggle to survive, their own life support in effect, uh, but that was due to low interest rates, and with low interest rates going, the zombies are going to go to the wall, at least some of them are. Um, this is the nature of capitalism. Uh, but we've been delayed, we've been spared that for, for quite a while. I think Brazil is an interesting case in point. Uh, volume of distressed Brazilian corporate debt in the first two months of this year rose from $10 billion to $12 billion. President Lula, first thing he did in office basically was to beg the central bank, please cut interest rates, give these companies a chance. The central bank rightly refused. Why? Because they don't know how high the Fed is going. And they can't stop until the Fed has stopped. Nicholas, you gave us the global tour de force in five minutes. That's super impressive. Um, following up on the previous discussion, I wanted your take on the key transformative trends. And one of them is, for example, the green transition that is coupled with EP mobility. Are we all going to be here in a few years with electric cars? Big data and AI we discussed already. We saw the excitement in the room. I'm guessing it's a big transformation or investment for them as well and tech, which is trickling down fast into societies. So a lot of transformations. What do you feel about these trends at Oxford Analytica? Are they reversible? Are they unstoppable? What's, what's happening? I think tech is a great one. Actually, on the subject of uh, what, what uh, comments at the back really inspired me is uh, right now, uh, if I was in Greek government, I would be rolling the mat out for, um, uh, uh, for Israeli tech companies. The uh, reason is a lot of these companies are desperate now to get out of Israel. They know that the, uh, the political environment isn't great. They know that the legal environment is, is under threat, that the uh, judiciary ind judicial independence is under threat. And they know that the international capital that they depend on for their funding is very, very leery of a reputational risk. Um, so that's just one as a side note. You just responded to Evangelos Gizelis who, <laughs> from Gizelis Robotics, who is also heading the task force of the Hellenic Entrepreneurs on Industry 4. So I think he was inspirational, and he's going to take your comment into consideration. And Thank you. On tech generally, I think there's, there's a really interesting question which you mentioned, which is regulation, the R word. And that's critical. And I don't know how that's going to go. What we do know for sure is that the technology is advancing so fast it is very, very difficult for policymakers to keep up. I want to take a slightly extreme example, if I may, and take your minds back to not one, but two congressional uh, testimonies on the tech sector. The first one was Mark Zuckerberg, if you remember that one, and he got the most easy questions you can imagine. Uh, sort of the zinger as it appeared was, might you ever one day not have a free version of Facebook available? Uh, as if that you know, matters in the least. What that said to anyone who looked at it is, is US legislators really struggle with getting on top of this technology. And if they're not on top of it, very difficult for them to write laws. But there's a much more recent one. And that was when the TikTok CEO, a few months ago, appeared in front of Congress. I'm not sure that the congressman knew anything more about that particular technology than they did about Facebook. But they'd already decided that TikTok was a problem and a threat, and they were going to shut it down. And I think that is the, that's the, the risk. And it's, it's, we're talking, not talking about a world, we're talking about distinct regions here. The United States approach is going to be different to the European approaches, massively going to be different to the Chinese approach. Chinese, uh, as you said, are ahead of everyone on this. They've been thinking about this very carefully. Um, so that's, that's the question I have on tech. I just don't know at what point does a government get panicked and just say, stop, stop everything. On the green transition, um, the problem is it's a contested process. Right? Uh, 
we know that we're going to green the power sector. That's already fairly well down the line, although there might still be a role for coal <laughs> at some point in a few years. Nuclear is a great idea, but actually a difficult one to get there, and, and there's a lot of public resistance in, in certain European countries to that. Um, I want to take you to the Netherlands for a moment, which is not a place you necessarily think about, because I think it's a really interesting early case of governments having to walk a tightrope in terms of transitioning the economy while doing everything else they're supposed to be doing, achieving a level of growth, making sure that you can pay for an increasing dependent population in terms of pensions and taxes. I mean, it was difficult enough. I actually feel sorry for governments right now. It was difficult enough to do the job. And now you've got this other thing as well, uh, uh, transitioning your economy without getting electorally slaughtered every, every time that the boat comes around. Netherlands is very interesting. It's one of the largest nitrogen emitters per capita in Europe. The government set a plan for reducing nitrogen emissions, which put quite a heavy burden on agriculture. Now, three years ago, uh, a fairly nativist pro-farmer party was founded in the Netherlands. That party topped the poll in the provincial elections uh, about six weeks ago. One of the interesting features of the Dutch system is that the Senate is filled by those provincial councils. Uh, so the government already knows that it is going to have to completely rewrite this nitrogen transition plan to put more strain on industry and less strain on farmers because these proposals, including compulsory purchase of farms and telling farmers to move areas to be less suitable, just wasn't going to fly. And it's a good example, I think, of how this process in certain sectors is really going to be contested and it's a struggle and we shouldn't assume that it's just going to happen. There's a, a Chinese saying about you cross the river by feeling the stones. Every government in Europe is going to be feeling the stones on the green transition. And those that aren't able to adjust mid to course correct in the face of a public backlash are going to have a real shock. Nicholas, may I add that we have business leaders here, and there are two sectors that we've mentioned that are transformed at the moment by technology much faster in terms of the pace of the evolution of technology than the capacity of people to keep up, of the human capital to be at pace. One of them is uh, the healthcare industry. The healthcare industry, the tech advancement is so exponential where doctors and medical staff cannot at the moment capitalize the technological growth at hand and the aptitudes that it has unlocked. And, and another one is ChatGPT AI because it has trickled down beyond the hands of the people that understand it. The people that will try to use it for business are experimenting and we don't know to what extent this will be an easy effort. Um, with that at hand and by means of closing and also touching on your main expertise which is geopolitics and we've taken you a bit off that and the title of Delphi. What do you think are the main threats and opportunities ahead? Ahead, We forget, perhaps, at this roundtable at the moment that we are experiencing wars as, as we speak. Uh, some wars were predicted to be short. They're still ongoing. Um, at the same time, the transformative uh, dynamics we've discussed have been interrupted in many countries uh, because of a series of reasons, economic, uh, geopolitical, and we, we are in an uncertain period. What what are you? What, and, but please, at the end, add some sanguine elements for the business leaders in sure. the house. Thank you. Um, so let me talk briefly about, about Ukraine. Um, right now, we appear to have a stalemate of sorts. We appear to have a stalemate also in July 2002, which very quickly gave way to Ukrainian advance. So I think it's worth bearing in mind always that these things are not these are a dynamic rather than a passive stalemate, and therefore one that it's, it's subject to change. Um, that said, uh, increasingly it looks like uh, the defense is much easier to perform than the assault. Um, and neither side, it seems, can readily muster uh, the men or the weapons in order to decisively push that front line in a serious direction, uh, and, and yeah, to, to move it seriously. The one, um, uh, I think, key variable here is actually going to be uh, when Western tanks arrive in the Ukrainian armed forces in the next few months, whether that might actually change the dynamics. Nevertheless, um, a deadlock, which I think is the reasonable forecast for the rest of the area, I don't think is going to lead to a negotiated solution. We're nowhere near that. Putin has no interest in peace on anything other than the most punitive terms. He is not looking for an exit, even though he's only 10 months now away from an election. 
Uh, Zelensky, likewise, is not willing to give way. Uh, if you want one word, one thing for why we're not going to have a solution, it's Mariupol. Ukraine gave up so many men defending that to the last. Ukraine, Russia lost so many men taking it to the last. Mariupol and that Azov Sea coast is not something that either leader, unless their neck is on the floor, uh, are going to give up. So, if we have a ceasefire, it's probably not going to be durable, just a consequence of exhaustion and the need to resupply. Even if we had a ceasefire, it is not going to be followed by political agreement, partly for the reason that I've mentioned. Putin's aims, remember, a maximalist. For not him, it's not about a chunk of territory. It's not even about NATO expansion. He doesn't accept that Ukraine should exist independently of Russia. Even if Ukraine expelled Russian forces from its territory, which in the case of lands that it hasn't controlled since 2014 is very difficult, there's little reason to believe that Putin would accept this as the end of the conflict. It's not the case that there are Ukrainian flags in Donbass and all of a sudden it's game over and we can stop the clock and that's the end of things. It's not the end of things. The dispute is so fundamental, it's difficult to be to say being resolved, in fact, while Vladimir Putin remains in power and alive. Western states don't want Zelensky to lose, and uh, uh, they don't want Putin to win. They'd ideally like to see Russian forces ejected from Crimea, but it's not simply a case of Ukraine recovering its territory. There are other factors to, that have to be satisfied. Ukraine has to look uh, strong in the face of a potential Russian counterattack, uh, able to defend itself. Uh, these are very, very difficult conditions to satisfy, much more difficult than simply pushing your army forward to, to the frontier. All of this argues, and now I'm going to talk about the Western policy dilemma, and I, I know I don't want to go on for too long. All this argues for a policy of Western states arming Ukraine in order to degrade Russian capabilities to a great degree, so that Russia is not able to mount a counterattack. The problem with that is how you calibrate those arms supply to achieve that conclusion without going too far. How do you wound Putin but not politically kill him? If you do kill him, what happens then? If we have regime change in Russia, where does that end? This is the country with the world's largest nuclear arsenal, 85 subject, asymmetrical, diverse federation. If it falls apart, it will be very, very messy. A few years ago, it was possible to hear politicians say, Putin's the worst, anything other than Putin will be better. That's not a shrewd diagnosis. That's a lack of imagination. Uh, there are plenty of worse things. Very briefly on China, and let, let me pivot then. Actually, just pivot to something positive. <laughs> well, China and US at the moment are at quite a crossroads. So yeah. maybe, maybe a very um, journalistic, sure. succinct manner. Tech, tech separation, I think, is proceeding. That's abundantly clear. I'm, very, uh, I'm slightly surprised that the Chinese reaction to all the semiconductor restrictions has not been stronger. They, they cannot. No, but, but in terms of, of say, uh, um, asymmetric retaliation, um, because it's, it's an attack on the governance technology of China as much as its ability to, to so thread the commanding we, heights. We, we can discuss that if you want, and I can explain why. I'm, I'm less worried about uh, a crisis over Taiwan. I think Taiwan is more an end of this decade rather than this or next year. But I think end of this decade, it's a very serious concern. And some optimism, just a highlight. <laughs> some optimism. So it, it's actually around the green, the green transition. Um, although, although my opportunity I'm spotting here is not necessarily in, in high tech, but is in, is in more basic things. So if you compare the, um, the European and the United States plans for green transition and the Inflation Reduction Act specifically, and then the two European programs that followed it, what you see is a desire, a deep desire to get more of the entire production chain in, crucially on minerals and on processing. The difference is that the European Union wants to put a cap of 65% on reliance on China for any one thing in that, and the United States wants to cut the Chinese out completely from 2025 for a range of strategic minerals. Uh, good luck with that. Um, that's going to be very, very tough. And the reason is um, China's footprint as a processor and as a refiner and a smelter 
is much bigger. It's a global stranglehold compared to its profile as a miner. So uh, one number for you. China mines less than 9% of copper globally. China smelts 38% of copper globally. You're looking at graphite, cobalt, it's 66%, 80% of refining capacity. The number is absolutely huge. The advantage for Europe, I think, firstly, is that there is more opportunities in mining and there's more opportunities in processing because the European aspiration is less explicitly Chinese. If the United States can achieve their aim of carving out their own independent supply chain, there will be much more scope and space for Europe and China to actually uh, collaborate on a green transition. And that's my answer. All right. Thank you.